Okay, welcome back everybody. So our first speaker for this session is going to be Matthew Oki O'Connor. Um, Dr. O'Connor is the co-founder and CEO of Scientific Affairs at Cyclarity Therapeutics. Cyclarity combines a computational and synthetic chemistry platform to create custom engineered cyclodextrins, which are cyclic polysaccharides, to capture and remove oxidized cholesterol derivatives, which are broadly toxic with no known function. Their lead drug candidate will target atherosclerosis and is months away from applying for IMPD permission to begin human clinical trials. Dr. O'Connor was awarded his master's degree in neuroscience from Northwestern Medical School and his PhD in biochemistry from Baylor College of Medicine. His postdoc research at UC Berkeley included work on muscle stem cells and aging, and he's the former vice president of research at SENS Research Foundation. So let's all welcome him to the stage. Thanks so much uh, for the opportunity to come and talk to you all today, and uh, thanks for your uh, patience and the little flip-flop in, in the scheduling. So, um, it, like you just heard, our, um, our vision at Cyclarity Therapeutics, uh, formerly Underdog Pharmaceuticals, is that um, we're engineering these cyclodextrins, these, these cyclic carbohydrate uh, molecules, uh, to, to become effective drugs. And I think I'll convince you today that, uh, that we've successfully created uh, at least one of those. <clears throat> uh, that our first uh, drug uh, indications are, are around reversing atherosclerosis, and uh, I'll try to convince you that we have a good plan to do that. And uh, our vision is that this will change the way that we treat uh, all age-related disease. Uh, and what I mean is, is broadly, if a company like ours uh, or like some of yours and some of the others uh, that we've heard about yesterday uh, or today are as enormously successful as some of us uh, dream that they will be, that, we, that it will be a, a fundamental paradigm shift in uh, how age-related disease is treated uh, when we start uh, treating diseases of aging uh, from the fundamental causes, the basic principles of what, uh, of what causes disease. So if you uh, risk adjust uh, some of the top causes of death, uh, heart failure, stroke, and COPD for the contribution that, uh, that atherosclerosis, the thickening of the arteries, uh, presents to them, then somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of all death worldwide is caused by atherosclerosis. So it's, uh, it, it's an uh, ambitious uh, and impactful uh, broad disease target. Currently, and, and thus far, most of the drugs that are used to treat atherosclerosis uh, revolve around uh, lipid lowering, uh, which basically just slows down the progression of the disease. Um, That's a laser pointer. Um, ah, this is a virtual laser pointer. Um, what we want to do is is tackle some of the the heart of the disease to actually uh, actually reverse it. Um, and so this is an atherosclerotic plaque. The junk in the middle is the necrotic core, uh, and these represent the the foam cells uh, here. So the basic ideology of atherosclerosis is that uh, macrophages are recruited to the site of a lesion in your arteries. Uh, the macrophages uh, gobble up all the junk that's there. That's their, that's their job. Uh, and they then turn into foam cells. And I believe that a big part of the reason that they turn into foam cells is that when uh, a macrophage eats too much oxidized cholesterol, uh, which is a percentage of the cholesterol that's there in these highly oxidative, uh, uh, highly inflammatory environments of an atherosclerotic plaque, that uh, their, uh, their lysosomes can't process it. Uh, they can't transport out that, uh, that kind of cholesterol. It clogs up the, uh, the lysosome, it stops metabolizing, and the uh, macrophages balloon up uh, and turn into foam cells become part of the problem instead of the solution, which uh, it creates a fundamental uh, step in the, in the maturation of the plaque. What our drug is designed to do is to excise the oxidized cholesterol from 
uh, tissue from solid tissue and from uh, living cells and uh, allow the macrophages to resume function uh, and then allow them to repair the plaque. So let me take a step back from, from that, from the disease, from the indication uh, that, uh, that we're looking at first, uh, and, and talk a little bit more about the, um, the type of drug technology uh, that we've invented and that we're working on. So cyclodextrins are these cyclic carbohydrates. They've been around for around 100 years. Uh, uh, the, the core building blocks of them are enzymatically produced uh, cheaply and, uh, uh, and in large volumes. Uh, but, um, and, and they've got uh, a, a great history of you know, being able to build all kinds of interesting things for them. In medicine, um, they're, they're well known, especially over the last two decades, they've matured into uh, a kind of um, uh, different families of molecules that can be used to deliver drugs as excipients, uh, which has taught us a lot about how to make them uh, very safe and uh, uh, you know, easy to deliver in uh, large concentrations in, in animals and humans. Um, there's, there's been relatively little attention given to making them into drugs themselves, and, uh, and that's what, uh, what we've tried to exploit. So what we did, our, our big innovation, was actually taking two cyclodextrin molecules, in this case two beta cyclodextrin molecules. I don't know why the video keeps doing that. I apologize for that. Um, and uh, and sticking them together in a particular configuration, and uh, it, it may be hard to see, but this is actually an asymmetrical molecule uh, that has a bit of a cone shape to it, and sticking them together head to head, and then engineering the, um, the chemical groups that decorate the outside of the molecule to, to create a specificity for a given target. So we can actually create a new cyclodextrin dimer that can encapsulate Anything that's small and hydrophobic around the size of cholesterol, that's say oxidized cholesterol, a molecule called 7-ketocholesterol in the middle there in yellow. Uh, so we can engineer a cyclodextrin dimer to encapsulate anything that's around that size and shape uh, fairly specifically. And we know a lot about how to make them so that they will be safe uh, in, uh, in, in biological systems. So uh, that's why I think cyclodextrins pre, um, uh, present a great opportunity for, for medicine and in terms of aging, anything that's small and toxic uh, that accumulates with age uh, will be able to build a, uh, a new drug against. Um, so I'll say a little bit about how we design uh, this and, and, and how we got to where we are. We have a computational platform that, that we built where we sort of hacked the, um, the building blocks for what uh, people have been doing for uh, the, the last uh, you know, 20, 30 years with proteins uh, to model cyclodextrins. And so uh, we, we had to build a lot of our own uh, tools for that. And uh, this, um, uh, th this effort has been uh, headed up by uh, Amelia Anderson uh, in, my, uh, in my group who's uh, working on her, uh, on her PhD. Uh, on this uh, on this topic right now, uh, and so uh, we do these uh, sets of increasingly complex simulations uh, that get down to the point where we can actually predict affinity constants uh, using potential mean force uh, calculations of our uh, uh, of a proposed drug of a of a theoretical drug uh, for a given uh, a given target. Uh, we haven't uh, we, we published uh, the, uh, the first part of this story last year, and, uh, and we'll be publishing an update on that uh, uh, later this year. Um, so uh, don't ask me too many questions about how it works, because uh, I'm, uh, I'm more of a uh, hardcore biologist than, uh, than a computational person. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there, uh, which is uh, the domain of that department in our company. Um, so. We're, uh, we're rapidly moving with our lead drug candidate, which we've dubbed UDP003, uh, towards uh, being a clinical stage uh, company. Uh, I'll tell you about how, uh, um, how it's uh, safe and, uh, and a little bit, very briefly, uh, about how it, uh, uh, how it works and how it's been effective. So uh, here's a, a summary of an awful lot of work 
uh, that's uh, been done in my, uh, in my lab over the last couple of years. Uh, in the first panel there on the left, uh, I'm showing you uh, a, a very um, uh, short uh, summary of what we've been able to do uh, in terms of removing uh, the target oxysterol, the oxidized cholesterol form that we usually measure, which is the most prevalent and stable uh, oxysterol uh, that is non-enzymatically produced. Uh, in, uh, from, from cholesterol. From, if you randomly oxidize cholesterol, more often than not, you come up with 7-keto cholesterol. So 7-keto uh, cholesterol, it accumulates in, uh, in many cells and tissues uh, in your body, particularly in plaque tissue. And uh, here what we've done is we've loaded up uh, monocytes with 7-keto um, with cholesterol, and we can show that we can remove it, uh, and we can actually do that in a dose-dependent manner in our drug from live cells. Uh, and we can do that in a variety of cell types, uh, and uh, uh, like I said, in a dose-dependent manner. Uh, what I think is most exciting here is that in that middle panel, uh, we can also do this from solid plaque tissue uh, taken from patients. So if we immerse uh, uh, plaque tissue in a, a solution of our drug, in a uh, concentration-dependent manner, we can pull it out. However, uh, if you look at those three lines, you can see that this is in a non-time-dependent manner. Uh, this, uh, it turns out that our drug comes to equilibrium in terms of pulling out large amounts of the oxidized cholesterol from the plaque in, in minutes, uh, not hours, which, which shocked us. Uh, it it uh, is really exciting, and that's important uh, because I'll tell you later uh, about how our drug is, uh, has a very short half-life in, uh, uh, in animals. Uh, and finally, uh, this uh, oxysterol uh, is, is highly toxic to just about every cell type in existence, and here I'm showing you data from uh, monocytes, which are the relevant cell type, where we can rescue the acute toxicity uh, from this uh, oxidized cholesterol form in a, uh, uh, in a dose-dependent manner at, uh, at a pretty low uh, concentration. Uh, more excitingly than that, something more functional uh, is that we're putting together a, uh, a pretty extensive story about uh, actually rescuing a foam cell phenotype. And so what I claimed before is that the way that this drug is gonna work in, uh, in people is that it's going to uh, rejuvenate the, uh, the macrophages and allow them to do their jobs again. And uh, what hasn't been shown before is, is actually um, turning macrophages into foam cells and then restoring them to, to healthy function. And uh, that's exactly what we've done. Uh, here on, the, uh, on your right, you can see the, the foam cells there and those blotches of red is a dye that stains, um, uh, that stains lipid. And uh, what we've done is we've, uh, we've foamed these cells up with a, a cocktail of bulk lipid and, uh, and the oxidized cholesterol, and then we can, uh, we can reverse that uh, with, uh, with treatments of our drug. We can do that in a dose-dependent manner. Uh, I haven't shown that here, just showing a little bit of the data. And uh, what I also haven't shown here is that we can restore their ability to phagocytose. So that's the main job of macrophages is to eat, uh, and they'll stop eating when they turn into foam cells, and we can restore that, uh, that function uh, in... Uh, uh, in, in a variety of macrophage uh, cell types uh, and under different uh, treatment conditions uh, th that I don't really have time to go into all the, uh, all the details of here, uh, and also um, forming them up in, in different ways with uh, OxLDL uh, versus uh, you know, bulk uh, lipid or uh, bulk 7-keto um, uh, cholesterol. So uh, that, that was a, a brief summary of uh, a lot of work that, uh, that my group has done. Here's another uh, even briefer summary of uh, an enormous amount of work that we've done in uh, uh, preclinical animal models. Uh, uh, here I'm just talking about safety. So um, we've, uh, on the left, it, that sort of takes the, the concentrations of those, uh, of those drugs and converts them into doses that you would give to an animal or to a human. So that's the dosing range that you would be in uh, if you were in an animal. And then that's a, a logarithmic scale, and we don't start getting side effects until we're up close to uh, a gram per, per kilogram of body weight uh, of, the, um, of the animal. So uh, the drug uh, is, is very safe. 
Uh, it, uh, it, it causes no side effects uh, until you get to extremely high doses, and, uh, and we hope that our effective dose uh, of our drug will, uh, will be uh, well under uh, 100 milligrams per kilogram. Um, uh, and so we hope to have you know, 10 to 100-fold uh, uh, efficacy uh, at 10 to 100-fold um, uh, doses lower than before you would start to see side effects uh, in, in people, uh, or you know, for now, in animals. <clears throat> so I'll, uh, I'll move on to our, um, uh, our clinical path, our regulatory path. So we've had four regulatory meetings so far uh, about our lead drug uh, molecule, UDP003, uh, one with uh, a pre-IND meeting with FDA, and three meetings in the UK, uh, which seems somewhat lopsided, but the reason is that after our first meeting uh, in, with the MHRA, which is the UK version of the FDA, uh, they invited us to apply for their new innovative licensing and access pathway, uh, ILAP, uh, which we did right away and were accepted right away. So we're in this accelerated uh, regulatory program uh, in the UK, uh, which, uh, which gives us advantages, uh, especially uh, unlimited access to the regulators now to, to get advice, uh, to, to bring data to them incrementally, uh, and, uh, and get them to sound off on, um, on the IMPD enabling steps that we're doing, uh, which is the permission to go into the, the clinical trials. Uh, and then later, they have uh, this program where they're planning to roll out a, a sort of adaptive licensing where in phase three, if it looks like there's evidence that your drug is helping people, then their national healthcare service uh, uh, may start to reimburse us uh, for our drug before it even reaches full market approval. Uh, so that's, that's a really exciting opportunity uh, for us. Um, the, the big challenge with cardiovascular disease, uh, with say uh, coronary artery disease uh, in particular, is uh, the requirements right now for, uh, to show a reduction in heart attacks and or strokes uh, and or uh, all-cause mortality. Uh, and that can take thousands of patients and it can take years and uh, years. And years. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll tell you next about how it is that we think that when you have a plaque uh, here on the left, this yellow stuff here is, is plaque tissue, uh, and that when uh, we reduce the amount of plaque, that, uh, that we think that that can lead to, to multiple uh, disease sub-indications that, uh, uh, that we'll be able to, to target in, uh, in phase three clinical trials. So our, our phase one clinical trial design is, uh, is just about done and ready for approval. Uh, of course, uh, the, the primary outcome will be safe uh, and uh, the pharmacokinetics uh, showing how long the drug uh, lasts in, um, uh, in people. Uh, I forgot to tell you uh, before, I promised to, to tell you that uh, we've done a pretty extensive amount of PK work in animals. And uh, as with other cyclodextrins uh, in rodents, the, the half-life of our cyclodextrin is, uh, is much less than an hour, somewhere around half an hour, uh, maybe even less. Uh, and so in humans, we expect it to be you know, in the neighborhood of uh, an hour or a few hours. So it's very important that our drug acts uh, very quickly the way that, uh, that I uh, claim that it will, uh, and, uh, and we'll be able to show uh, how long it lasts. We'll also be looking at some exploratory endpoints uh, and some target engagement, say, uh, you know, hopefully being able to detect uh, the oxidized cholesterol being uh, removed from, uh, from people, from volunteers in, in phase one. Phase two, we'll be able to, and we may be able to get, uh, if we're lucky, we may be able to get some anecdotal data uh, from... Uh, from middle-aged people who aren't diagnosed as being atherosclerotic, but just uh, uh, coincidentally, since they'll be, uh, uh, you know, over uh, 50, uh, they'll uh, they'll have some some plaque. So uh, we'll be able to uh, in going into phase two, uh, we'll we'll definitely have people with uh, with plaque buildup uh, that we'll be able to measure with uh, uh, um, with uh, non-invasive uh, angiograms, uh, and uh, and then that will help guide us towards uh, perhaps uh, some smaller indications like peripheral artery disease. Uh, or, um, or angina, which is a chest pain that you get from, from atherosclerosis, uh, or maybe going straight into, if we get some massive uh, uh, investment or partnership, uh, into a, uh, a CAD indication. So we've raised $14 million to date. We'll be raising soon uh, for uh, our, um, uh, to go into uh, Series A uh, and for, uh, to, to power our clinical trials, which will be starting next year. We've, uh, we're already manufacturing at kilogram scale and uh, GMP quality 
uh, material. Uh, and uh, we're finishing our GLP safety uh, studies in uh, small and large animals now. And we'll be applying for uh, IMPD early next year and starting in the UK. Uh, I'll just uh, skip uh, the, the market analysis and say, obviously, uh, there's going to be trillions of dollars in curing atherosclerosis. And uh, we're going to be worth um, uh, billions or, or maybe uh, a trillion dollars uh, in the next few years. Uh, and uh, <laughs> this is what we're going to spend all our money on. Um, so uh, we, um, like, like I said, uh, CAD, PAD, maybe even uh, cr um, uh, carotid stenosis. We got a small grant to test our drug on, on Alzheimer's disease. That's a whole different story. Um, we're also interested in stroke recovery, also a different story, uh, very interesting. Uh, I claimed earlier that we can uh, create uh, drugs that can target anything that's small and hydrophobic. Uh, one uh, family would be bisretinoids that accumulate in the, uh, in the eye uh, with uh, uh, macular degeneration. Um, and, uh, and other targets and other oxysterols as well. Uh, we've got strong patent protection for these cyclodextrin dimers and, uh, and one issued patent this year. We've got an amazing uh, team of, of experts uh, and these are the people that do all the work. Thanks so much for your attention and I'll uh, pass it on to the next speaker. Are we uh, doing questions or? Uh, well, it, it, can, it, it can clear the oxidized cholesterol within minutes. The plaque will need to heal from the action of the macrophage, which I anticipate would take months. Yeah, I think it's, it's, I actually wrote a whole review article about this when we were starting the company and published it at the, in, in 2020. Uh, the, the oxidized cholesterol is, is um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it create, it causes the cells to foam up, uh, which causes the plaque to grow. It's also very pro-inflammatory. Uh, and uh, I, I also propose a hypothesis by which it, uh, it contributes to the calcification uh, of, the, of the plaque tissue. Uh, so hopefully when we stop that, we'll, we'll cease the progression of that process and even uh, reverse it and, and allow the plaque to heal. Uh, but yeah, I do believe that will take months for us to see in, a, in like an angiogram. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, everybody.